Hey, everybody. Uh, 4th through 6th and 7th, 8th Old Testament class. Uh, my apologies for getting this video out so late. Um, I recorded the whole thing and was editing it and realized I just had so much video content on my computer from previous projects that, and the only way to get my computer, it's older, to get rid of the old content so I could make the new content was to erase all the video files. So I'm re-recording this now for the second time today. Um, we are going to do our lesson on Song of Solomon, so go ahead and turn to that page in your notes. You can pause the video to get there. Um, we're going to begin with the meaning of the name, just like normal. Um, the meaning of Song of Solomon, some of you may have Song of Songs, depending on the translation of the Bible that you have. They both mean the same book. It means just a uh, the song or the poetry, either of Solomon meaning like of the same school of wisdom and poetry as Solomon, or dedicated to Solomon. Um, that is what the name means. The author is unknown. We're not exactly sure who the author is. We do know that God uh, has inspired this book of the Bible, like he has the rest of scripture. Um, Solomon may have collected these poems and put them together. Um, and Solomon is actually mentioned in the book as a character. But Solomon is different than the two main characters, and we are not convinced uh, entirely that he was the author. Um, so that kind of sets us up as we get going. Uh, let's talk about background information next, because remember, it's helpful to keep the background information in mind so that you reading this on your own can be like, oh, that's right. This is what this book is about. Um, it's helpful to remember this is our last book of poetry. So when we come back on Thursday, we're going to do a deep dive into the books of poetry. The first thing to set on your background is number one, when you read this, um, there are uh, two main characters that we're going to see, a shepherdess and a shepherd, and they are in love. They're in love. Um, the characters of the shepherd and the shepherdess are betrothed, and that is semi-equivalent to our engagement period that we have here in this culture. But their betrothal, and I'm going to use that word um, because it's more specific with this Israelite history. Betrothal back then meant uh, a lot stronger bond than just the engagement period here in the United States that we're used to. Um, their finances were starting to come together. The man in the betrothal, the groom, would go off and often build on to his father's house or build a house uh, to prepare for his wife then coming to be the head of, of the uh, domestic affairs of the household. And um, if someone would break a betrothal, it was very equivalent to what modern day divorce is. You're really breaking off a relationship there. So those are our two main characters who are in love. They are betrothed to each other. And then the second thing that's helpful, because this is one of the poetry books, there are a couple different ways that we uh, have seen biblical scholars interpret this in the past. One way is to think of it as an allegory. And remember, in an allegory, you have things that are more concrete and easier to understand, representing bigger, more abstract concepts. So some believe that this is an allegory between God as the shepherd, and then the shepherdess represents the people of Israel. And it's supposedly um, documenting the relationship between God and his people. That's one way to look at it. The second way to interpret this is that these were love poems, cultural love poems written in ancient Israel, um, and uh, they are all connected celebrating love and marriage between a man and a woman. Um, and uh, I think definitely as you read through the Song of Songs, it's helpful to think of both the allegory and the actual literal love poems, because we're going to talk about how it connects to Jesus later where we have an allegory that Paul gives us in Ephesians between Christ and the church. So those are our two background things. Four themes. Um, so theme number one that we're going to see in this book as you read through it um, is that it deals with that God created male and female uh, both in his image. And they're characterized by the shepherdess and the shepherd. And God's design in male and female were good. Because if we go back to Genesis 1, we see that theme carried through here, um, that male and female are both made in his image, that both are necessary uh, uh, genders here on earth. 
and that God designed marriage between one man and one woman. And we see that love relationship in the shepherd and the shepherdess in this book. Um, they are for each other and for nobody else. Their relationship is exclusive. Um, there are other characters that we see usually in groups, like the maidens that are the friends of the shepherdess and then the chorus and the court, and they're all like, yay, you're getting married, okay? But the exclusivity, meaning nobody else, okay, in this marriage design uh, is celebrated as what is good. So that's number one, that God created male and female, both in his image, and then designed marriage between one man and one woman, and this design is good. The second theme that you see through the book of Song of Solomon is that uh, human affection and romantic love is a good thing. It's a dignified thing. Uh, it is upheld as holy in scripture through this whole book and in other places in scripture. So uh, we see in here that not only have the uh, shepherd and the shepherdess made commitments to each other, which a commitment is an act of the will. I'm vowing to do these things even when I don't feel like it. But they're praising each other. And uh, the shepherd is talking about how beautiful uh, his bride-to-be is. And the bride is talking about how excellent her groom is. And they're praising each other and delighting in each other's qualities in a way that's both poetic. So if you read some of them, you're like, it says her neck is like a tower. Does she have a stony neck? No, it's all metaphor. It's poetry. It's beautiful. Okay. But that this kind of expression and affection is good. Sometimes in our marriages, we need reminders of that, that the praise and affection and love towards each other needs to be expressed. So that's number two. Number three, we see that marriage itself is a holy and good and wonderful institution. Um, you can't just have um, semi-committed relationships to each other. This shepherd and shepherdess were meant for each other. They were betrothed and they were going to become one flesh. This goes... Uh, throughout the Bible, okay, we see it, God instituting marriage in Genesis 1 and 2. We see people messing up marriage and God's design all over the Old Testament, okay? We studied David and Solomon, and we know that they had multiple wives. Solomon's so crazy. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and it was just a mess. And that breaking and twisting of God's design for marriage is what eventually led Solomon's heart away from him and even David's heart away from him. This idea of um, wanting to go outside God's design uh, for marriage, but that marriage as God designed it is holy and good and wonderful. And it brings joy um, and blessing to both the husband and the wife. Okay. Um, and then num that highlights number four is that God's design for relationships and how they work is perfect. Through the Book of, Sol of Solomon, there are high points where the um, fiancés are praising each other. The betrothed are like, oh, I love you so much. You're so wonderful in this way. You're so beautiful in this way. And then there are other times where they uh, have some fights and they're working through conflicts together. And there are times that the shepherdess handles the conflict well and things resolve. And other times where it's not handled well and it takes a while for things to resolve. So seeing how uh, in this uh, collection of love poems, uh, we're given a little picture on the inner workings of how a relationship actually plays out. Unlike in the movies where we tend to see the couple gets together at the end and then we just end with happily ever after. Whereas with Song of Solomon, you get to see them working through different temptations in uh, their betrothal stage, fights, spats, and then celebrating marriage uh, at the end. We're not going to do any key verses for this particular book. Um, so I want to get us down to uh, how this points to Jesus. Jesus? I hope you said that to yourself as I got here. Okay. How does it point to Jesus? How this points to Jesus is that the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, Solomon celebrates the mystery of the marriage relationship. That one man and one woman betro betrothed to each other, they're going to become one flesh. Okay. That's what this book celebrates. This mystery of marriage, Paul helps us understand how it points to Jesus in a profound way. And that this design of how it was going to point to Jesus was in place before the foundations of the world. Okay, Because um, God had this plan in putting Adam and Eve together in the first marriage relationship. This was going to give us a picture of what Jesus was going to do um, with himself and his church. 
So actually turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians is in the New Testament. And if you find Matthew, that's the first book. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, first four Gospels. Okay, then Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Those are all larger. And after 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you have four smaller books that are letters uh, to different cities where the new churches were. Galatians is the first one. Ephesians is the second one. So Ephesians chapter 5, second to last chapter. Okay, we're going to read verses 22 to 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Remember, we're talking about this marriage relationship here. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself as his savior, its savior, excuse me. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself, this idea of presenting as a bride, in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy, without blemish, this idea of no sin, no darkness. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So Paul is helping us see that this picture of a man and a woman in marriage is not just a relationship that was made to, to bring us happiness and uh, we get to do life with our best friend here, which is kind of what the American culture says. It's all about your happiness. Paul is helping us make this connection that God's whole intention of creating the marriage relationship is so we would have a tiny little picture and understanding of Jesus and his church. So under the mystery of marriage and how it points to Jesus, here's our first subpoint, letter A. Okay, Christ is the head of the church and gave himself up for the church. And in a marriage, the husband is supposed to do the same thing, giving up his preferences, his dreams, his um, idea that I have rights. Okay, he's to give them up for the sake of his wife and then eventually the children that they have through them, okay? Um, so the husband and wife, the husband is the picture of Christ in the marriage. And then just as the church submits to Jesus, the wife is to submit to her husband, okay? This word submit in our culture is like, I don't like the word submit, okay? Because as human beings, we're rebellious and we don't want to submit to anyone. You tell, you tell someone a rule, the first thing you want to do is be like, I don't want to do that, I want to break it, okay? So submission is actually a biblical um, godly principle. The son, Jesus, submits to the father in all things. So wives are a picture of Jesus submitting to the father. Husbands are a picture of Jesus leading his church. Okay, so both husbands and wives get to imitate Jesus in different roles. Okay, so A, Christ is the head of the church and gave himself up for her just as the husband gives himself up for the wife. Um, B, is that within a marriage, okay, notice how much in, in Ephesians 5 was talking about Jesus wants the church to be clean from all sin, from all idolatry. Um, and it talks about in the Bible that God is jealous for the love of his people. And that's a good thing. Christ is jealous for the love of his church. He doesn't want us worshiping any other gods, okay? No other God is worthy. Anything else in this universe has actually been created by him. So why would we want to worship something that's not the creator himself. So that's why when we look in Song of Solomon, we see that uh, the marriage is between the shepherd and the shepherdess, one man and one woman together. Okay. It's, it's a picture of there's no other spouse. Okay. No other gods are in the picture between Christ and his church. And that's why there should be what we call fidelity in marriage, faithfulness to each other. C, uh, the last one I want you to write down is that anyone who's a follower of Jesus is part of the church. The church is not a building. The church is the people of God. 
Um, so we, the church, are now members of Christ's body. Not only is it like a husband and a wife, it's like a head and a body. So Christ is the head. Um, our brains drive all the decisions and the functions of our body, okay? Me doing this right now is my brain sending a signal to the fingers to do the thing. Happy fingers, okay? Um, so Christ is the head, and um, all of us who are believers are the body, okay? And we're part of him and how holy and sacred and wonderful that relationship is. There's that same kind of relationship happening between a husband and wife. They become one flesh, uh, a marriage relationship is different than any other relationship you're going to have. There is a oneness that happens in marriage that doesn't happen on the same level between a parent and a child. It never comes close between friends, okay? There is a mysterious thing that God put into marriage um, that you become one flesh. And so um, that kind of closeness in relationship is the same idea that we get with Christ as the head of his body, the church, okay? So all that to say how it points to Jesus. Marriage is so much more than just a human institution. Humans did not invent marriage. Tuck that away. Humans did not invent marriage. God designed marriage. He invented it. He put it into place. So he's the one that gets to put a definition on what marriage is. He says it's between one man and one woman for all time. Now, is there so much grace when we twist and break and distort his original design for marriage? Absolutely. So much of scripture talks to that. Um, but Song of Solomon is a great place to start and see like the beauty of what a marriage relationship can be and how we don't just bring in the mental side of it of like academically, it is this, this, and this. But we also see the affection and the love poured out between the man and the woman and how beautiful that part of marriage is. Because just like we praise the Lord, for who he is, and that's a fulfillment of our love towards him, we should be expressing our love, or our marriages as Christian marriages should be expressing love toward one another, just like we see happening in the Song of Songs. So I will see you guys on Thursday, get those notes written down, and I hope you guys had a very restful Tuesday.